Hey Life Groups, welcome to this uh, next part of our series in the way of Jesus. Uh, this practice that we're looking at is fasting. Uh, it's an interesting practice as, uh, as we go forward. As we think about upstream and downstream pr practices, I would guess for most, this would be upstream. And by that, I would just mean something that's more abnormal or even more difficult to practice. So regardless of where you come from from this conversation, uh, it's interesting to note that in 75, 77 times in scripture, uh, it talks about fasting. Baptism is mentioned 75 times. So this is really on par with this idea of baptism. As we think about fasting, even in our wider culture, in our secular culture, um, it's, it's really well known. It's actually really popularized through things like cleanses, the keto diet, intermittent fasting, even through history as people have done hunger straits they've used food uh, and even going without food as, as tools. In other religions, uh, you have the month of Ramadan in Islam where they fast all the time. Judaism includes fasting as well. And so in Christianity, it's a well, well, well documented of its history with fasting through the Jewish uh, scriptures in the Old Testament. Uh, Daniel has a fast in the Old Testament. Jesus fasted for 40 days. And actually, as we're going to see, he expects our, uh, us too, his disciples as well, to fast. So uh, what, what we're going to do, what we did this weekend, is uh, looking at two big ideas. The invitation to apathy and the invitation to hunger. So what I, wanted, what I wanted to do just with the invitation to apathy is just to look at really our modern culture and how our modern world promotes apathy through functional atheism. So uh, the idea that, you know what, I say I believe in God, but really there's nothing in my life that uh, makes me depend on him. So it's not that the world is bad. That's not what I'm saying. I never want to say that. But what I want to say is that it's not neutral. So I think in our current cultural moment, the enemy, the Satan's plan uh, for us as Christians is not really to persecute us physically as some of the Christians in our world go through, but rather his plan is to slowly lull us to sleep with apathy, to really put us in a place of we don't really care about the things that God really cares about. So how does the modern world do this to us? It's not through hard power. It's not through military might, but rather through soft power. So if it take two, th two ways, there's lots more, but take two. The first one is through pop culture, the idea that we consume mass media. So the average media savvy person of 30, one person says, has seen 35,000 hours of audiovisual narrative. This person's father, 20,000 hours, their grandfather, 10,000 hours, and their great-grandfather, 2,500 hours of, of media, of audio, audiovisual narrative. So we are consuming more and more of this as possible. And what I would say is that it's not neutral. Pop culture, the Oscars, media, music, current culture is not a neutral thing. It has an agenda to slowly bring us away from the things of Jesus. That's the first one. Secondly, is technology. Technology uh, makes us uh, believe that we can't be alone with ourselves. There's an author, David Zoll, who says, stimulation, regardless of how trivi trivial or pixelated, distracts us from that which we would rather not feel. It, 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 technology has this way of basically making us not feel the things that we should feel. Technology gives us the illusion of control. So we have more ways to be in control than ever. You can track how long you sleep, how many steps you take. But in doing so, what we end up doing is being controlled by this by this technology. So again, not a bad thing, but it does shape and form us. So what does this do to us? What do these things, how does our modern world uh, affect us? What it does is it promotes functional atheism. It makes us self-sufficient, proud. We just kind of think, is God even really necessary? If I need food, I go to the store. If I need to go somewhere, I get in my car or an airplane that I can control my life. It makes us autonomous. So really we don't need prayer. There's not a sense of desperation of life in the West. It makes us hedonistic, that we just want to feel good. So whatever makes me feel good is what I'm going to do. This plays into our cultural ideal of the therapeutic self, that if I'm not feeling good, something has gone wrong. And so I have to make myself feel good through religion, Jesus, food, narcotics, whatever it is. And fourthly, it makes us passionless. 
We don't want to be too committed to Jesus. We want just enough of Jesus to kind of help us uh, self-actualize, help us be the person that we want us to be. So we're kind of skeptical of the fanatic. We don't really, really want to be known as that. But is that really the discipleship that Jesus has for us? How do we push back? How do we get from being deformed to being formed in the image of Jesus? And this is my second idea, the invitation to hunger again. Matthew chapter 6 is uh, where we see the Lord's Prayer. And we know the Lord's Prayer. It says, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we've also forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil. And really well-known moment in the Sermon on the Mount. Immediately following that moment, though, is his teaching on fasting. Listen to this. And when you fast, not if you fast, but when, when you fast, do not look as somber as the hypocrites do for their, for they disfigure their faces to show others that they are fasting. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you fast, again, the expectation, put oil on your head and wash your face so that it will not be obvious to others that you are fasting, but only to your father who is unseen and your father who sees what is done in secret, listen, will reward you. So this is an invitation in prayer and fasting to hunger again for the things of God. So what is fasting? Fasting is the voluntary denial of a normal function for the sake of intense spiritual activity. With some of our practices, we engage, we read our Bibles. For some, we disengage with, from things and that is fasting. So the voluntary denial of a normal function for the sake of intense spiritual activity. It is for the sake of something. It's not to lose weight. It's not, it is for the sake of spiritual activity. That's a definition given to us by Richard. Foster. And as I said, what is fasting? It is expected. Jesus, a few times in his gospels, there's another moment where he expects his disciples to fast. So what does fasting do? Three things. It reveals our dependencies. I don't know if you've ever heard this phrase, hangry. It's putting hungry and angry together. And some of us, when we don't eat or when we don't have breakfast, we get hangry. Well, what, that's an interesting phrase. What is it telling us? It's showing us that in order to be kind, we need to have food. It reveals a dependency. So when we fast, we, we give up the things that we are dependent on. John Piper, in his book on fasting, says, And she, or fasting, remedies by intensifying the earnestness of our prayer and saying with our whole body what prayer says with the heart. I long to be satisfied in God alone. This is what fasting does. It reveals our dependency. Secondly, it reorders our desires. We realize that we don't, we don't have to serve our stomach. See, what Jesus does is he reorders our priorities. Instead of body, soul, mind, spirit, and God, instead, they're reordered. So what's first is our is God, and then soul, then mind, then soul, and then body. See, our primal desires are our body. We're hungry, we're thirsty, and so we do that. What fasting says is you don't actually need that as much as you think you do. And so it reorders our desires to love God as number one. And finally, it reignites our prayer. So if you're, not, if you're not praying while you're fasting, you just, you're just hungry. But fasting, every time you feel that hunger pain, it's a reminder to pray, to commission God, to confess, to bring your concern, your kids, your finances, your world, whatever it is, to God. It is a constant reminder to pray and be dependent on God. As Jesus says, man does not, li- man does not live um, on, on bread alone, but everywhere that, that comes from the mouth of God. So where do I start? If this is you, you want to reignite your prayer, you want to reorder your desire, and, and you want to reveal your dependencies, where do you start? We got ways. The first thing is on your own. Personally, do this. Maybe food is a big deal for you, and you physically can't go without food, but what would it look like to give up something? Lent is coming up, a season where you can personally give up your phone or watching sports or chocolate or something that would help you. That's something personally you can do. Corporately, we do this together as well. Come and pray for our weekend gatherings, pre-service prayer, Saturday night and Sunday morning before a 9 a.m. gathering. Come once a month to our revived prayer nights. Come hungry, fast that day and 
come corporately as we seek to be hungry for God together. Lent is coming up, a season in the church calendar where you can give up something for this reminder. But my challenge is for you, do one thing. Phone, meal, one meal a day. Start somewhere accessible. And remember, it's not about trying, it's about training. The first few times will be difficult and hard, but the more that you do this, the more it will become normal. Bless you now as you discuss. Thanks.